Radioactivity and radioactive materials have many peacetime uses. But we know, too, that they can be used harmfully, as in atomic bombs. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. This is a result of the photography taken somewhere, sir. There's a medium-range ballistic missile launch site and two new military encampments on the southern edge of the Sierra de Rosario in west central Cuba. The launch site in one of the Encampments contains a total of at least 14 canvas covered missile trailers measuring 67 feet in length, 9 feet in width. The overall length of the trailers plus the tow bars is approximately 80 feet. The other encampment contains vehicles and tents, but with no missile trailers. The site you have there contains at least 8 canvas covered missile trailers, 4 deployed, probable missile erector launches. These are unrevetted. The probable launch positions, as indicated, are approximately 850 feet, 700 feet, 450 feet, for a total distance of about 2,000 feet. How far advanced is this? Uh, sir, we've never seen this kind of an installation before. Even in the Soviet Union? No, sir. Never had any U-2 coverage in the Soviet Union, so we do not know what kind of a practice that it used in connection with... How do you know this is a medium-range ballistic missile? The lens, sir. The what? The lens. Yes. Uh, Mr. Graviel, our missile uh, man, has some pictures of the equivalent Soviet equipment that has been dragged through the streets of Moscow that can give you some idea of that, sir. There are two missiles involved. One of them is our SS-3, which is 630 miles long, and our 700. It's 68 feet long. These missiles measure out to be uh, 67 foot long. The other missile, 1100 foot, uh, is 73 foot long. The question we have in the photography is the nose itself. The nose cone is not on that missile. It measures 67 feet. The nose cone would be 4 to 5 feet longer, sir. And with this extra length, we could have a missile that have a range of 1100 miles. So, so did you be by it? No, sir. How long have we timed that line? Can we know how long we know what it depends on how ready the TSC, how far it is. What does it have to be fired from? It would have to be fired from a stable, hard surface. This could be factor, it could be concrete, or an asphalt. The surface has to be hard. But this is important as it relates to whether these today are ready to fire. Mr. President, it seems almost impossible to me that they would be ready to fire with nuclear warheads on the site without even a fence around. It may not take long to place them there to erect a fence, but at least at the moment there is some reason to believe the warheads aren't present and hence they are not ready to fire. The unknown factor here, sir, is the degree to which the equipment has been checked out after it's been shipped from the Soviet Union here. It's the range of the equipment. If the equipment is checked out, the site has to be accurately surveyed. The position has to know. Once this is known, then you're talking a matter of hours. Mr. President, there are a number of unknowns in this situation. I want to comment on my And in relation to them, I'd like to outline very briefly some possible military alternatives. The first is that if we are to conduct an airstrike against these installations or against any part
part you. We must agree now that we will schedule that prior to the time these missile sites become operational. Now, I'm not prepared to say when that will be, but I think it's extremely important that our talk and our discussion be founded on this premise that any airstrike will be planned to take place prior to the time they become operational, because if they become operational before the airstrike, I do not believe we can we can knock them out before they can be launched. And if they're launched, there is almost certain to be uh, chaos in part of the East Coast or the area uh, in a radius of 600 to 1,000 miles from Cuba. Uh, secondly, I, I would submit the proposition that any airstrike must be directed not solely against the missile sites, but against the missile sites plus the airfields plus the aircraft, which may not be on the airfields but hidden by that time, plus all potential nuclear storage sites. Now, this is a fairly extensive airstrike. It is not just a strike against the missile sites. And there would be associated with it potential casualties of Cubans, at least in the hundreds, more likely in the low thousands, say two or three thousand. If, if there is a strike without a preliminary discussion of Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchev this, is a, this is an extensive strike we're talking about. Oh, I hope it is. Uh, but you know, I, I, I think we must assume we'll kill several hundred. Soviet citizens. Having killed several hundred Soviet citizens, what kind of response does Khrushchev have open to him? It seems to me it, it just must be a strong response. And I think we should expect that. And therefore the question really is, are we willing to pay some kind of a rather substantial price to eliminate these missiles? I think the price is going to be high. It may still be worth paying to eliminate the missiles. I think we must assume it's going to be high. The very least it will be, will be to remove the missiles in, in Italy and Turkey. I doubt we could settle for that. Mr. President, I think that uh, it's easy sitting here to, to underestimate the kind of sense of a front that you would have in uh, the allied countries, but even perhaps in, in Latin America, if we act without warning, uh, without giving Khrushchev some way out. The opinion and the reaction would be very much different. <coughs> a course of action where we strike without warning is like Pearl Harbor. It's, it's the kind of conduct that one might expect of the Soviet Union. It is not conduct that one expects of the United States.
consensus uh, was that we should go ahead with the blockade beginning on Sunday night. Originally, we should begin by blockading Soviet uh, against the shipment of additional offensive capacity. That we could tighten the blockade as the situation required. I was most anxious that we not have to announce the state of war existing because it would obviously be uh, bad to have the word go out that uh, we were having a war rather than with a limited blockade for a limited purpose.
This government feels obliged to report this new crisis to you in fullest detail. The characteristic of these new missile sites indicate two distinct types of installations. Several of them include medium range ballistic missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead for a distance of more than 1,000 nautical miles. Each of these missiles, in short, is capable of striking Washington, D.C., the Panama Canal, Cape Canaveral, Mexico City, or any other city in the southeastern part of the United States, in Central America, or in the Caribbean area. This urgent transformation of Cuba into an important strategic base by the presence of these large, long-range, and clearly offensive weapons of sudden mass destruction constitutes an explicit threat to the peace and security of all the Americas. The size of this undertaking makes clear that it has been planned for some months. Yet only last month, after I had made clear the distinction between any introduction of ground-to-ground -ground missiles and the existence of defensive anti-aircraft missiles, the Soviet government publicly stated on September 11th that, and I quote, the armament and military equipment sent to Cuba are designed exclusively for defensive purposes, unquote. That there is, and I quote the Soviet government, there is no need for the Soviet government to shift its weapons for a retaliatory blow to any other country, for instance, Cuba, unquote. And that, and I quote the government, the Soviet Union has so powerful rockets to carry these nuclear warheads that there is no need to search for sites for them beyond the boundaries of the Soviet Union, unquote. That statement was false. Only last Thursday, as evidence of this rapid offensive buildup was already in my hand, Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko told me in my office that he was instructed to make it clear once again that Soviet assistance to Cuba, and I quote, pursued solely the purpose of contributing to the defense capabilities of Cuba, unquote. That, and I quote him, training by Soviet specialists of Cuban nationals in handling defensive armaments was by no means offensive. And that if it were otherwise, the Soviet government would never become involved in rendering such assistance, unquote. That statement also was false. Neither the United States of America nor the world community of nations can tolerate deliberate deception and offensive threats on the part of any nation, large or small. We no longer live in a world where only the actual firing of weapons represents a sufficient challenge to a nation's security to constitute maximum peril. Nuclear weapons are so destructive and ballistic missiles are so swift that any substantially increased possibility of their use or any sudden change in their deployment may well be regarded as a definite threat to peace. But now further action is required, and it is underway, and these actions may only be the beginning. Regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. My fellow citizens, let no one doubt that this is a difficult and dangerous effort 
on which we have set out. No one can foresee precisely what course it will take or what course or casualties will be incurred. Many months of sacrifice and self-discipline lie ahead, months in which both our patience and our will will be tested, months in which many threats and denunciations will keep us aware of our dangers. But the greatest danger of all would be to do nothing. The path we have chosen for the present is full of hazards, as all paths are. But it is the one most consistent with our character and courage as a nation and our commitments around the world. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender or submission. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere and we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. I want to say to you, Mr. Zorin, that I don't have your talent for obfuscation, for distortion, for confusing language, and for double talk. And I must confess to you that I'm glad I don't. But if I understood what you said, you said that my position had changed, that today I was defensive because we didn't have the evidence to prove our assertions that your government had installed long-range missiles in Cuba. Well, let me say something to you, Mr. Ambassador. We do have the evidence. We have it, and it's clear and incontrovertible. And let me say something else. Those weapons must be taken out of Cuba. And next, let me say to you with a... that if I understood you with a trespass on credulity that excels your best, you said that our position had changed since I spoke here the other day because of the pressures of world opinion and the majority of the United Nations. Well, let me say to you, sir, you are wrong again. We have had no pressure from anyone whatsoever. We came in here today to indicate our willingness to discuss Mr. Uthant's proposals. And that is the only change that has taken place. But let me also say to you, sir, that there has been a change. You, the Soviet Union, has sent these weapons to Cuba. You, the Soviet Union, has upset the balance of power in the world. You, the Soviet Union, has created this new danger, not the United States. And you asked with a fine show of indignation why the president didn't tell Mr. Gromyko on last Thursday about our evidence at the very time that, the, that Mr. Gromyko was blandly denying to the president that the, United, uh, that the USSR was placing such weapons on sites in the New World. Well, I'll tell you why. Because we were assembling the evidence, and perhaps it would be instructive to the world to see how a Soviet official, how far he would go in perfidy, while we're asking questions, let me ask you why your government, your foreign minister, deliberately, cynically deceived us about the nuclear buildup in Cuba. And finally, the other day, Mr. Zorin, I remind you that you didn't deny the existence of these weapons. Instead, 
we heard that they had suddenly become defensive weapons. But today, again, if I heard you correctly, you now say they don't exist or that we haven't proved they exist. Let me ask you one simple question. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no? Uh, I Mr. Stevenson, would you continue your statement, please? You will receive the answer in the due course. Do not worry. I am prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision.
Moscow. Premier Khrushchev has sent a message to President Kennedy today. The Soviet government has ordered the dismantling of weapons in Cuba, as well as their crating and return to the Soviet Union. They retreat to Moscow. Russian ships steam out from Cuban ports with their decks loaded with missiles the Soviets are withdrawing under pressure from the New World. I think looking back in Cuba, what is of concern is the fact that both governments were so far out of contact, really. I don't think that we expected that he would put the missiles in Cuba because it would have seemed such an imprudent action for him to take, as it was later proved. Now, he obviously uh, must, have thought, must have thought he could do it in secret and that the United States would accept it so that uh, he uh, did not uh, judge our intentions accurately. Well, now, if you look at the history of this century, where World War I really came through a series of uh, misjudgments of the intentions of others. When you look at all those misjudgments which brought on war, and then you see the Soviet Union and the United States so far separated in their beliefs, and you put the nuclear equation into that, uh, that uh, struggle, uh, that's what makes this, as I said before, such a dangerous time and that we must proceed with the firmness and also with the best information we can get and also uh, with the uh, with care. The United States, as the world knows, will never start a war. We do not want a war. We do not now expect a war. This generation of Americans has already had enough, more than enough, of war and hate and oppression. We shall be prepared if others wish it. We shall be alert to try to stop it. But we shall also do our part to build a world of peace where the weak are safe and the strong are just. We are not helpless before that task or hopeless of its success. Confident and unafraid, we must labor on, not towards a strategy of annihilation, but towards a strategy of peace.